kickboxing. Beats and rhymes. No one can do it better. So Lennox Lewis is advising Fraser Clark ahead of his rematch with Fabio Wardley on October the 12th on the undercard of Arta Baturbia versus Dimitri Bibble for the undisputed light heavyweight title. Lennox said he was impressed with Fraser Clark in his first fight with Fabio Wardley, but he needs to fix a few things and the adjustments could make the difference. Fabio was pretty hard on himself. He said he looked back at the fight. He doesn't normally play back his fights. And he said all he could see was mistakes. He couldn't see nothing well he did. So he was being pretty hard on himself. Lennox said, if you're going to box with your feet in the sand, there's no way to box. You're not going to get too far. All the great heavyweights had a great jab. You've got to develop the jab. He's also dispensed advice to other British heavyweights in the past. David Price was 15-0. 13 inside the distance in 2013. He was the main prospect in the UK. Not Tyson Fury. It was David Price. When he ran into Tony Thompson, a veteran who was supposed to be on his way out, he turned David over in the second round with a right hand that Price said went round the back of his head. The referee didn't even give him a count and just waved it off. That was the only blip he had had. But he says the biggest regret of his career was taking a rematch so soon with Tony Thompson. Another regret was going to train with Lennox Lewis in Canada because the timing just wasn't right to bring someone new into the fold who tried to change so much of what Price was doing already. David went to Canada, trained with Lennox, and Lennox changed everything about his training, about his style, and he regrets taking that fight that soon. But it wasn't to be for David Price. I remember the fight and I remember watching David trying to use this movement but I said D this ain't him this ain't him and when it went wrong in the fifth very good fight he had Thompson down Frank Maloney who used to promote Lennox Lewis and was now promoting David Price went absolutely crazy he lost his mind he started crying he started pointing to Lennox who was standing up ringside watching it unfold camera just pointing towards him he just looked awkward and just totally out of place and the David Price train just never got back on track. Soon after that, Frank Maloney turned into Kelly Maloney. Like Frank Maloney did an interview after. And he was talking and then he just went hysterical and started crying. Just broke down. Price never worked with Lennox again. Yeah, Frank's with me. Listen, chins on the floor from everybody ringside. You were nervous in the build-up. You were right to be. What on earth happened? The wrong sort of fight. The wrong tactics were used. Whatever he'd done. Tony Thompson showed his experience, uh, full credit to Tony Thompson. David Price, that wasn't the game plan I expected them to go in the ring with. It wasn't the one I was told we were going to use. Um, I don't know what went wrong in there. I mean, I haven't had time to talk to David or, or that, but that definitely wasn't the game plan that should have been used in that fight. Did, did the early knockdown influence the way he attacked, or did he want to make a point tonight, one way or another? I think he might have made, maybe wanted to make a point. Maybe it was the influence of Lennox Lewis, because Lennox Lewis sometimes likes to slug fast. But you can't have Lennox Lewis and a David Price. They're two totally different built fighters. You know, you have a six foot eight guy who should work, keep his fights long when he's had someone like that in there. He went in to slug it out. You know, that reminded me of Lennox Lewis against Shannon Briggs. And I'm thinking, what am I watching here? This is not, this is not what you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to work on a jab. Whose idea was it to, to have Lennox come in in the first place? Well, they're all going to sit down and talk. And, and that talking will no doubt involve what next? That's the... That's the, that's the question on everyone's lips. Well, I was going to say, because uh, last time, five months ago, this, effect, this affected you quite badly it, it, with your health, never mind anything, anything else. How are you feeling right now? Tough to say. All right, listen, so, I appreciate it. Thanks. Let's get back up to Steve. -O. After he asked him how he was feeling, Frank Maloney just broke down, and that was the last we saw of him in boxing. Next time we see him wearing a frock. Yeah, his was weird. I believe Pricey was being trained by Franny Smith at the time. And if... Pricey went out to Canada to train with Lennox and changed his whole style. What was Lennox doing across the other side of the ring looking like he was waving instructions? Why was he not in the corner? It was one of the weirdest things. Athens 2000, Lennox sent Orly Harrison a message, a letter of encouragement before Orly boxed his way to victory in the 2000 Athens Olympics at Super Heavy. Lewis became somewhat of a mentor and at times a cheerleader of Audley's. He warned Audley not to go across the pond to launch his pro career. There was apparently a deal with Evander Holyfield. And Lewis said, what can Holyfield do for you over there? There's no need to rush your decision. And 
Audley turned pro in the UK. Audley got a lot of criticism. He started on the BBC. He didn't turn pro with either Barry Hearn or Frank Warren. And Frank Warren had a column in one of the red tops. And he used to slate Audley off a lot. You know, if you go against the system, there's going to be backlash. And also, he wasn't performing up to the build-up he was giving himself. So his first six fights were spread over, let's say, a year and two months. And Lennox said, all he needs to hurry up his fights, hurry up his career if he's to become heavyweight champion. In the year or so it took Audley to have six fights, Lennox had around 11 or 12 fights in his first year. But it was a different time and two different fighters. Lennox asked the British public to give Audley time to get his together he cheerleaded Audley before the first Danny Williams fight which he lost and he was cheerleading him to beat David Hay challenging for the Haymakers WBA heavyweight title 22,000 at the ME arena sold out crowd that fight was so disappointing and David Hay's next fight with Vladimir Klitschko after crashed the pay-per-view platform on Sky crashed it for near on two years there was no pay-per-view on Sky Sports no pay-per-view boxing until Carl Frutch put up 30,000 in the Kessel rematch and it was service as usual David Hayes the main culprit but Orly Harrison played his part in the demise of Sky Sports pay-per-view two years in the wilderness could be just bad luck for Lennox he's been behind David Price and Orly Harrison and neither of them achieved anywhere near their potential is there any um, irony that the two fighters that Lennox mentored ended up fighting each other in fact it was the last highlight reel knockout that David Price scored before the wheels came off against Tony Thompson he was 13-0 box nation Frank Warren shamelessly matched Price with Orly Harrison two years after the David Hay debacle and they put on the old razzle dazzle promoted the life out of the fight and it lasted a few seconds I remember covering it on this channel and I said beforehand when this non-competitive fight ends quickly, don't blame Audley that he didn't perform. This is down to Frank Warren, Steve Lillis, and Steve Bunce, and whoever else was trying to make it out to be a serious fight. Lennox Lewis is still determined to work with an upcoming British fighter and turn him into a world beater. Anthony Joshua was actually in Jamaica after AJ became super heavyweight Olympic champion in 2012, Lennox wanted to sign him. Pretty much documented, Lennox wasn't happy when AJ hooked up with Matram and Eddie Hearn. Did AJ do the right thing? Because there's some people who critique AJ's career, but we're talking about a two-time former unified heavyweight champion. The question is, is would he have done more if Lennox did play more of a pivotal role in his career? Things got really bad by 2018. By this time, Anthony Joshua was unified heavyweight champion. And the rivalry with the WBC champion at the time, Deontay Wilder, was simmering. Back and forth about who was ducking the fight. This offer was made, that offer was made, etc. Lennox decided to take Deontay Wilder's side and said that Anthony Joshua was ducking him. Obviously, AJ didn't like that. He didn't say anything. Lennox took several more jabs. And then after AJ lost to Andy Ruiz... And Lennox started throwing more shots, being very critical, speaking about Rob McCracken. He took a little subliminal and said, when you go to university, you can't take your third grade teacher with you. He won't have answers. By this time, you need a professor. AJ eventually said something in retaliation and said, Lennox is a clown. I don't respect Lennox. Lennox fired back. Any thoughts of them working together at this stage is unlikely. But up until... um. A few weeks back, before AJ lost to Daniel Dubois, this is what Lennox had to say about Anthony Joshua. And he's talking about the period between the first Usyk loss, where he lost his belts, 2021, and where he got rid of Robert McCracken and what followed on after that. You know, in the past, I've said some stuff and it's just been taken wrong. And I'm like, I'm a positive person. I don't really like putting people down. So for them to take it wrong without speaking with me is a problem. And there was a moment in AJ's career after he split with Rob McCracken and he decided to go and try and really change his style drastically and with different coaches. And I really felt that if he had a form of mentor that could say, AJ, that's not you, man. You're 30 odd years old. You have a great style. I think that could have saved him all those two years that were lost. Oh, 100%. People do things their way and the way they know how to. And... The problem with a lot of the boxers, they're doing it 
for the first time. Their managers and people around them are doing it for the first time. So they don't really get the information from the people that's been there that's done it. And to me, that's just a waste of time. And they're loyal to maybe the people that was helping them up there, but those people can only take them so far. You got to go to the people that's there, that knows the business, that knows how to run the business, that's been there, knows all the tricks that may come up. Then you're on a different level. Would you have nipped that in the bud if you'd have had that phone call and, hey, look, I think I'm going to become a boxer puncher and move around a lot at 30 years old? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a lot of complex things to that. <laughs> So he's basically saying, despite the back and forths, that he would have still liked to have advised Anthony Joshua after the first Usyk loss. He talks about what he would have nipped in the bud, what a lot of the people around him were missing and couldn't offer him. Which is all well and good. I'm imagining how frustrating it must have been for Lennox Lewis because he's obviously seen the potential there or he wouldn't have got so worked up in some of the things he said about Anthony Joshua. And the other question is how deep is his advisory role with Fraser Clark? And is it a good idea? Hey, let's see what Fabio Wardley and Fraser Clark do on Saturday. I'm interested to see who's going to make the adjustments. Can Fraser Clark get his feet out of the quicksand, like Lennox was saying, and get that jab working even better than it did last time? That was his best punch in the first fight. Is there a good chemistry between Angel Fernandez and Lennox? Or is this something... Frazier is doing separate from what he does with Angel. The last thing he needs is to be conflicted between what Angel is saying and what Lennox is saying. Boxing beats and rhymes. No one can do it better.